Welcome to episode three of the Campus Salt Show. We have Ben Rosenblatt here for, from the Radiologic Technology Program. So, Ben, what does a, a radiologic technologist do exactly? In the imaging field, you have your... Um, you have your physicians that the patient is seeing, and they're going to, you know, check to see if something is wrong. In order to do that, they refer the patient to um, a location where they can get the imaging done. Um, radiologists, the doc the other doctor, um, mm -hmm. they're ultimately the ones that are going to look at those images and interpret them. Right. But then someone needs to actually take those images, and that's where the radiologic technologist comes in. So what I'm doing in the program is basically learning how to take x-ray images of patients. Okay. And what, um, is there a single machine or a variety that you operate? Oh, yeah. Um, Interesting thing in uh, medical imaging, you have lots of different varieties. You've got um, your conventional x-rays, which um, most common, uh, the most cost efficient, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but in, And they give a good deal of in information. Um, other modalities would include uh, CT scans. Mm -hmm. um, you have your MRI. Um, and then there's like specifically mammography. Uh, right. And the like, and um, but for me personally, you know, going into X-ray, that's the first step, right. and then after that, to go into the more advanced imaging, um, just some more training. Okay. Yeah, for our listeners or viewers who might be interested, what are some indications that you think someone might enjoy this career? I think absolutely the main thing. If you're considering a career in, in any of the allied health professions. Mm -hmm. um, you need to have an interest in the patient as a human being. Uh, it's true that when you go into, um, you know, one of the allied health professions, it's, it, it can be good money. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're in there just for the money and you don't particularly like dealing with people and you don't have an empathy for them, um, you're going to be miserable. So mm -hmm. number one, um, are you interested in people? Do, are you empathetic with people? That's That would be the number one thing. Uh, number two, specifically for x-ray imaging, there's a good deal of critical thinking involved. Mm -hmm. You can't just learn from the book and expect the book to provide the answer for every patient because every single patient is going to be different. You could do the same exam. Um, you, you could perform the same exam 10 times in a day. Uh, and each time that same exam will actually be different just because of uh, how the patient is. So you have to use your, um, you know, good deal of critical thinking to see how can you adapt this exam to each specific patient. Um, and finally, I mean, you have to have a good eye for detail because you're going to look at these images before you send them to the radiologist. Um, or the ordering physician. And you on the fly, you have to decide in about 10 seconds whether or not the image is good enough. And um, it takes a good deal of training to mm -hmm. really recognize those details. So ultimately, empathy for the patient, uh, critical thinking, and attention to detail. I think those would be three things that would uh, make a good candidate for x-ray. Yeah. Can you give us an example of changing an exam for a patient? Absolutely. For the standard chest exam, um, those get ordered a lot because, especially during the pandemic, because of mm -hmm. COVID, um, doctors want to see the condition of the lungs. So mm -hmm. chests are one of the most commonly uh, ordered exams. Mm -hmm. If you're doing a chest on a healthy 20 to 30 year old, you just stand them right up to the board and you point and shoot. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty easy. But then you might have to do um, a chest exam on a on an infant. Well, then you're going to if the infant is, you know, combative, right. you're going you might need to have the pa the parent in there, yeah. and you're going to be doing it tabletop. So the pa so the infant's laying down, and someone has to hold the infant in place. Mm -hmm. um, then if you're dealing with a, um, a geriatric case, let's say it's someone. Uh, who's unable to stand, um, even for a brief amount of time, or right. someone who, who has uh, mental difficulties, maybe Alzheimer's, right. um, you're probably going to have to do the chest exam with them sitting in a wheelchair. And with the wheelchair, 
um, that can show up on the image as well. Okay. So you have to make sure that you're, you're using other uh, pieces of equipment. You know, um, you have to change the exam uh, because they're not going to be up against the wall. You, you have to like use a mobile sort of um, image receiving device. Right. So those would be three like big ways. Then you've got you know general age, uh, body thickness, um, and mobility, other mobility issues. There's lots of ways that a chest exam uh, can change, and mm -hmm. that's just one of hundreds. You know, right. so yeah. What career path were you on before this? Before this, I was a piano teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I've loved music ever since I was a child, and I've really enjoyed teaching music, especially to children. Yeah. What, what led you to make a change? When I uh, finished school at Western, um, I ended up teaching in a studio setting. Um, the owner of the studio had approached me, and um, they offered what seemed to be a very good deal. They said that they would recruit all the students for me, and they would take care of the entire business side. And so all I would have to worry about is the teaching. Unfortunately, it didn't end up being the case. I did have to mm -hmm. focus a bit on the business side. Right. Um, and ultimately, the individual ended up exploiting my work. They changed the contract several times mm -hmm. without my consent, really. Um, but I had no option but to go along with it. So I was left feeling very stressed and unhappy. Right. Um, I wasn't making enough money. Um, and all of this was sort of affecting my work teaching yeah. and the students were not getting the quality that they deserve. So this, this led me to the conclusion that I had to really change careers. Mm -hmm. For x-ray in particular, my dad is a retired doctor. My uncle is currently a doctor and my brother, he works as a tech as well. Um, with uh, not an x-ray, but a different area. But what he did say to me was, if he were to do it over again, he would choose x-ray as the path to go. Why is that? Well, with x-ray, the money is pretty good. But uh, even more importantly is, is the variety in x-ray. Mm -hmm. In x-ray, um, you could be working in just a small sort of urgent care clinic, uh, or an outpatient clinic. You could be doing orthopedics. Um, you could be working at uh, maybe a small rural hospital or, or a large level one trauma hospital. Um, if you want a slow pace, it's there. Um, slow pace with other coworkers, you can certainly find that. Or if you want really fast, high pressure cases, that is also available. Or even if you want to work on your own and, and actually do mobile x-ray to various people's houses, that that's there. <laughs> the point being, there's something for everyone in x-ray. And then if you want to even go further into the other advanced modalities, MRI, CT, etc., you can do that as well. Cool. So before your life got busy with uh, school and the career change, what kind of hobbies did you pursue? Well, it's been a while, but um, I used to be an avid rower. I mm -hmm. rode competitively all through high school and college. Um, I was recruited to Gonzaga University. Um, I've enjoyed um, rock climbing a bit. Mm -hmm. I like reading. Um, video games I don't have time for anymore. Um, but even before I got busy, I, I was busy. Uh, it seems like um, with the birth of my daughter, my hobbies and interests started to align with mm -hmm. taking care of her. So we've done a lot of hiking, walking in the parks. We, we like to bike around. And, and then those are sort of the hobbies I enjoy now. Yeah. As a classically trained pianist, I'm just curious, do you enjoy popular music? It's a good question. Um, when I was growing up, my parents were uh, maybe a little bit elitist when it came to music. Um, to put it simply, I was sort of raised to believe that classical music was superior to all the other forms of music. And if we're going to be specific, Western European art music. Okay. So... Um, but as I got older, 
especially in the last uh, 10 years, I'd say, um, I've come to realize that there, there, there really is something of value in other forms of music. Uh, pop, hip hop, rock, jazz. There's brilliance in all of those areas. Um, so, so I do enjoy other forms of music today. Um, just as there's good pop music and bad pop music, there's, <laughs> there's also good classical music and really bad classical music. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest. There's, there's classical music that makes us snore. So, um, yeah, I enjoy other forms of music. Mm -hmm. Are you able to perform some of your favorite songs or pieces? Yeah. Um, sometimes what I like to do is I'll take the easier music and I'll just sort of play through without thinking. Mm -hmm. um, it It's sort of like being one with the instrument and not having to worry about it. Some of my favorite pieces are quite complex, though. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't resist the big Rachmaninoff pieces or Beethoven. Um, and in those cases, I may spend, you know, five, 10, 30 minutes on a single passage and I want to, I'll play it over and over to try and get it right. And the satisfaction is, is not so much from just playing through without thinking, but, but in finally accomplishing it and in, in solving the problem involved. And, and when I finally get it, I enjoy it. Yeah. Since this is a Christian show, could you tell us a little bit about your faith background, growing up, what your parents believed? Mm -hmm. uh, my mother was raised Catholic, mm -hmm. and my father was raised Jewish. Um, my brother and I, we, we were essentially raised with no religion. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say exactly why, but, but I suspect it has a little bit to do with my parents' um, experiences with religion as they were being raised. Yeah. Um, for my mom, she was, um, she was born out of wedlock mm -hmm. and was given up for adoption at birth. Um, she never met her biological father. Um, it was sort of kept a secret from her. Right. Even when she asked many years later, they wouldn't tell her. Yeah. Um, and later on, uh, she divorced from her first marriage. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Church essentially rejected her, mm -hmm. and she was cast out. For my father, um, he was, uh, you know, he went to synagogue. He had his bar mitzvah. Um, his father was sort of a hard man. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not sure how that would have impacted uh my father's uh, experience with religion, but mm. in the end, he ended up not following the religion very much. Mm -hmm. My uncle still does, but my father's not practicing. Mm. And in the end, uh, my brother and I simply were not raised with religion in our lives. Yeah. Um, really, come to think of it, we viewed religion negatively, mm -hmm. or at least I did. Um, I think one positive aspect would have been, uh, I used to, when I'd sleep over at my friend's house and he was Catholic, we'd go to, um, we go to mass the mm -hmm. next morning. Um, and I, I found that to be a somewhat pleasant experience. It was enjoyable to just be in that social setting for me. Mm -hmm. Um, many years later when I went to Gonzaga university, which was interesting, you know, it was a uh, I have my Jewish background in going to a Catholic university. Yeah. Um, I, I studied the Bible um, extensively uh, from an academic perspective, mm -hmm. but I, I'd never read the Bible before that. And it was not what I was expecting. Mm -hmm. I found it to be full of wonderful stories, lots of, um, lots of admirable teachings, lots of confusing things to me as well. Mm -hmm. But it changed my perspective um, on Christianity in particular. Uh, one class that I very much appreciated was the Christian diversity class, where I attended services um, from different denominations, uh, Greek Orthodox, Pentecostal, uh, Southern Baptist. Um, I saw a number of different services, each one different and um, 
And it really did change my perspective on things. Yeah. So, Would you mind sharing what you believe currently? I'm not an atheist. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if I would even call myself agnostic. I think I lean towards the idea that there is some higher power or organization. Mm -hmm. I don't have faith in a single being who's interested in um, interceding on humanity's behalf. Mm -hmm. um, rather, I think I believe in something that's a little bit more beyond comprehension. <laughs> it's so complex. It, I, I think it's, I think, I can't really put it into words. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. For the signature question of the show, what is it that convinces you personally to believe what you believe? I think um, just looking at how absolutely enormous the universe is yes. and how small we are in that universe, um, I suppose I find it a little bit hard to believe that only we would be singled out mm. as some special creation. I think that there's a lot to admire about us as humans. But rather than seeing us as masters over other parts of creation, I, th I think that we're more interconnected on the, in that regard. But I also don't think it's random, you know. I, th I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if we all fit into some sort of greater plan. Mm -hmm. um, so I suppose it's, it's a little bit of lack of faith, but also a little bit of logic but then a little bit of faith that there is some some greater power out there. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's been fun having you on the show. Ben. Thank you for having me. This was enjoyable. Yep.